Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Sound Booth Theater Live. My name is Justin Thomas James, and I am here with the wonderful Andrea Parsono. <laughs> Yes, that is it. <laughs> and uh, we're we're gonna read some stories. Um, basically, if you are if you were expecting Jeff Hayes, uh, obviously neither of us is Jeff Hayes. What? Yeah, no, I'm not. No, I'm not Jeff Hayes. Are you just? This is a not, con. What the? Uh, no, 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 I'm not. I'm not him. I'm not him at all. Uh, yeah. So Jeff, uh, Jeff has the night off tonight, and uh, I. I guess we're running the show, Andrea. I guess I guess I'll stay. Okay, fine. You'll stay. Okay, I'll stay. Fine. You, you were gonna leave though. I was gonna leave. Oh, damn. I, I don't want to be any part of this. <laughs> okay. Well, hopefully, I can win you over, and maybe the audience over too. Uh, I I basically just started uh, a narration career. Uh, I live in uh, Canada, uh, which was just introduced to ACX a few months ago, and uh, yeah, I'm with Ireland. Along with Ireland, yes, Ireland and Canada were were the first countries, other than the states and England, to receive ACX. Uh, so I've just I'm totally green, and um, I was lucky enough to pick up a story by Domino Finn, which is a lit RPG book called Reboot. And uh, did you say earlier that you'd read Reboot, Andrea? Or? No, I'd seen all the promos for it. I haven't read it yet. I yeah. <laughs> no, no, don't apologize at all. There's a whole list of them that are amazing that I still need to read. <laughs> I feel envious that you haven't read it and you still have the opportunity to experience. <laughs> yes, it for the first I get time. to experience. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, it's it's a great book. Domino Finn is a fantastic author. Uh, we are going to be reading a little bit of that, uh, but that was pretty much my foray into narrating. I'd done some small things before then, but uh, that was my first official audiobook. But either way. Um, why don't you tell the people a little about about yourself, uh, Andrea? <laughs> I uh, hi guys. I've been here before, so most of you have seen that. Hopefully, if you haven't, hi, I'm Andrea. Um, I started narrating pretty recently too. I started out in about February, and I just fell in love with doing it. Um, Jeff helped me along, along with William D. Aaron. Both of them were kind of my shepherds in this whole process. And I just, I really enjoy the lit RPG genre. That's kind of my little nerddom that I enjoy. So when I picked up Dominion of Blades and Wild Waste, even though Wild Waste isn't technically lit RPG, a lot of people say that it kind of has a feel to it. Um, it basically, I just really enjoyed the whole genre and had a blast with it. And Dominion of Blades was my first lit RPG and then moved on to Wild Wastes. And it's been, a, it's been a lot of fun. Now we're doing Wild Wastes too. And it's been really well received and that's a lot of fun. So yeah. I, I love this. Yeah, it seems like it's getting fantastic reviews on Audible. So is so is uh Domino Finn's uh re reboot. Reboot. I yeah. called it Domino. That's Domino? the book is Domino, apparently. Uh, that's gonna be his, the sequel. The sequel. Yes, exactly. Reboot. Domino the sequel RPG. Is Domino. <laughs> um yeah, that's that's fantastic. Uh just like and what what's your history with with narrating before before you actually started narrating you were into music right yeah i was a music major i was a vocal major in college and i i was really unhappy with it just because of the the type of music they were doing it's it's very classical music which is beautiful and i completely understand it as like the, the basis for what we know as modern music but I was scheduled to perform like four different Italian arias and I just, it, it was killing me. So I moved on and became a theater major. And in that interim, uh, uh, William D'Aaron looked at me and was like, so have you ever thought about narrating audiobooks? Yeah, so yeah. It worked out really well and I really enjoyed it. What actually got you into narrating in the first place? Uh... Uh, you know, if I go back far enough, it would be my dad would always go to the library and he'd always pick up books on tape from the library, funnily enough. And he'd listen to them like late into the wee hours of the morning. Like he'd play them really, really loud, even though oh, he was asleep. So cool. And I would just like stay awake because I could hear this audiobook like blaring. <laughs> and uh, I just, I always 
kind of loved it. And I thought that that was what people did. I thought that that's what kids did. They listened to audiobooks. So um, anyways, like down the line, I was, I, I was, I'm a musician as well. And uh, okay. I was, I was in a job that I was kind of thinking, yeah, you know what? It, it involved music. It was music therapy, but I thought, you know what? I want to do something else. And I started thinking about other things that I could be doing and things that are mobile that I could do pretty much anywhere. And uh, I started just a friend of mine wrote some short horror stories and I thought they were good. And then one day I just had a microphone and I thought, yeah, I'm going to try narrating these. And he really liked them. He was happy with them. And then I just had a blast doing it. And so one thing led to another and I started just narrating short stories that I found online. Um, Ray Bradbury um, read some of his short stories and uh, yeah. And then eventually I started thinking, okay, maybe I can get paid for this. So then I quit my job and uh, now I'm narrating uh, without a safety net under me. So uh, that's a lot of fun. <laughs> I just noticed this because I'm looking at the YouTube. It is me. It is all me. Do we have it set to splash back and forth? <laughs> oh, oh yeah, yeah, we do. <laughs> uh, you know what? I'm so used to, <laughs> I'm so used to doing hangouts where I'm not the one running it. <laughs> so I just like, I normally set it on the other person and then just forget about it. Uh, so I, I was keeping it on you so I could actually feel like I was talking to someone instead of actually like talking into a mirror. Cause right now it looks like I'm talking to myself. You know okay. I mean? <laughs> All right. I so the, I was sitting here the whole time you were talking, <laughs> I'm looking at the YouTube channel. It's just me going, <sighs> And I'm like, oh, guys, that's awkward. That's awkward. <laughs> yes, just the live reactions. Yeah. Reaction it's, cam. It's Andrea reacts to Justin talking. That's <laughs> a Fine Brothers production. Well, what do you think? Should we get to some uh, actual lit RPG, what people want to hear? I think we should do something. We should yeah. read something. Let's read something. Um, first, I'll show off my dog that is... <laughs> <laughs> She was just patting my leg. This is Taffy, everybody. Taffy is a uh, a dog. I don't remember what breed. She's my mom's dog, actually. So. <laughs> well, there you go. Now let's get into some reading. What are we starting out with, Andrea? I think we're starting out with the games we play. The games we play. And who wrote this? Uh, let's see. Do we Ooh. have that information? Dan, Danny, somebody, do we have this information? Yeah, if someone, I'm, I'm looking at the live chat right now, and uh, we got a few people joining us, uh, and I just want to say hello to uh, yes. uh, Sound Booth Theater Live. Hello, Sound Booth Theater Live. Uh, we've got Daniel Katz, who I believe is is a member of Sound Booth Theater Live. Yes, is Danny, that... is, Danny is our amazing and incomparable admin for the page. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. And then we have Mike, the bassist. Mike, I know Mike from another YouTube channel that I run called the Invictus stream. And he is, I, I guess he saw that I was live and, uh, I didn't mention this to the Invictus folk, but, um, I'm glad you're here, Mike. Hello. And, uh, do we have anybody else? Hayes McGee. That, that sounds like Mike, uh, Jeff Hayes. I think I know. I think I know Hayes McGee. I might. Hayes I McGee? might be mildly acquainted with Hayes McGee. <laughs> Hayes McGee may or may not be my husband. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> then, uh, well, the if anybody watching has any questions or uh, has any suggestions for how we go about doing this, then uh, I uh, I'm more than open to hearing those suggestions. Love to see looks, suggestions. It looks like Danny says that it was a, he sent it, it's a fanfic by Ruji. Rugi? R U U G I. I'm going to go with Rugi or Ruji. I'm not sure. Depends on the origin of the word. <laughs> Perfect. All right. So we are starting at just the top, right? Uh, yeah. The games we play shift. The pain faded after a moment. That's you. Okay. Should we give the basic backstory? Oh wait, Danny. Danny said he put the suggestions in here for us. I say we. I say we read them just just because I like that idea. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, John 
uh, the, the two characters, two main characters are John and John's mom. And uh, I'm going to be playing John. Uh, he's a male teenager. Main character is basically your typical male MC. Uh, so he probably sounds like this. Um, probably not. Although more mature than most. Okay. All right. And John's mom, uh, which she doesn't ever really, they don't say what her name is. Uh, she's a really strong warrior. But other than that training, she's, she's pretty harsh. So that works. That's yeah. What, that's what we're going to do. Tough. Okay. And then uh, as a backstory, uh, for anybody who hasn't uh, read this story, in a world of monsters where most people have some unique ability, John's recently discovered that his ability is that the world treats him as if his character, uh, as if he is a character in an MMO with stats, skill books, uh, he can see the names and equivalent levels of those around him, etc. Uh, John just finished a pretty dangerous mission, after which he told his parents the whole story, mission and new ability. His parents are both hunters, which is the job for those that fight the monsters on a regular basis in order to keep the rest of the population safe. Um, so kind of like reserves, I'm thinking. Um, his parents are incredibly strong, and I, th I thought that this was really interesting. Um, to give a baseline, he's currently level 13 and can't see the levels of those 50 levels above his, and he can't see the levels of his parents. Uh, and his mother is now training him, determined to make him as strong as possible so that he doesn't die in this dangerous world. That's like cool that it. he can't see, uh, can't see levels above 50. I like that. I like it when get, when uh, books utilize that as a component because it kind of adds to the whole mystery of is he a level 250 or is he a level, you know, 75? It's just, yeah. I think it adds fun to it. Definitely, definitely. And it's totally unique to lit RPG, which, I mean, I think it's interesting that, I mean, I'm, I'm brand new to lit RPG. I've only read one <laughs> lit RPG book. Um, so I, I'm totally fresh. But... I think it's interesting. It's such a cool concept that different little pieces of information that are presented through the system and the mechanics of the RPG itself can influence the story and and help, you know, provide extra narrative, you know? Know what I, like I mean? It. I know exactly what you mean. I think it <laughs> works really well in that genre. Uh, hello? You're going to be doing the narration for this one, right? And I'm yes. doing the mom. I'm going to be playing the mom. Not you're going to be playing the mom. Not, and you're not doing the mom? This is the internet. I got to be careful. <laughs> do the mom now. All right. Just uh, going to do a quick shout out to say hello to Sindavaz. And he just subbed to my channel. So thank you, Sindavaz. Okay. Without further ado, here is the games we play by Rugi. Rugi. <laughs> Shift. The pain faded after a moment, but I laid there, breathing hard, body pushed to exhaustion. I could already feel regeneration working to alleviate that, though. Then I healed myself to hasten the process, clamoring to my feet just moments after going down. As long as I was alive, as long as I had power to fuel my skills, what happened to my body was almost irrelevant. So I pushed on through, looking at my opponent. You've gotten stronger. My mother praised, waiting patiently as I rose. We stood together in the clearing I'd made during my training back. Well, sometimes it was hard to remember that it was actually not all that long ago. It was only a week or two ago that I'd been wasting away some time out here training myself for the mission. I wasn't sure when she'd found this place, though it probably hadn't taken long after finding out I was missing. I wonder what she'd thought when she saw it. She must have known I came out here to practice, but what did she think when she saw the pockmarks I'd left behind beside the disturbingly pristine trees I'd healed? Did she see something in the marks, go over them again and again, trying to discern some hint as to my whereabouts? I didn't know, and it made me feel guilty again. But now I was, well, getting my ass kicked, honestly. She'd brought me out here to train, asking about my skills to begin with. I'd given her a rundown of what I could do, where I could give specifics, 
the MP costs, the my MP and HP bars, uh, how to regain my SP and HP by healing myself, how I replenished HP and MP at a rate of 1% a minute prior to of the other modifiers, and the general stuff about the gamer's mind and body. All of which she'd dutifully noted down in her notebook. I'd even listed my exact stats and given the general descriptions of most of my skills, though a lot of those things were more relative. As a result, I wasn't surprised in the slightest when she'd demanded a sparring match to test my strength. I wasn't surprised when she asked I show her my full power either, though I'd warned her. Not about any danger to her, of course, because that'd just be silly. I still couldn't see her level, which meant she must have been, I wasn't sure, but at least level 70 something. I had neither fear for her safety nor any delusions of victory. What I'd warned her about had been, quite simply, about the costs of the tigers, uh, or the white tigers 500 years, and that just because the gamer's body and my various skills made it look like I was invincible didn't mean I wasn't taking damage. I didn't want her to splatter me on accident or something. So I made sure she knew my limits and that I might need to heal myself periodically. She'd nodded in acceptance and told me it wouldn't be an issue. It hadn't been. She'd just put me down hard and then let me scrape myself off the ground before going again. Even with my vastly enhanced speed, she kept up with me without a single wasted movement. Her eyes were alert and her face expressionless as she calmly parried each of my strikes with her sword, probably more to test my strength than anything else. You used your fists as your weapon on your mission? She asked as we fell into what probably counted as a relaxed rhythm when your level was in the stratosphere. I went to nod, but aborted it to shake my head. I had gauntlets, I said, hands on the restored Crocea Moors as I tried with all my might to push her back. I wouldn't succeed, but that wasn't the point of this exercise. Even so, she said, taking a step closer with no apparent effort, pushing my feet back along the ground. I couldn't use observe on her, so I wasn't sure how her strength compared to Penny's, but she wielded it with an ease and grace that set her apart. There was strength and surety in every motion, a silent confidence in her casual stride as she pushed back. Is that your weapon of choice? I half shrugged, trying to stay upright and braced against the immense weight. Uh, I needed a fighting style that was different from my own, I explained distractedly. Fell a little behind because I trained my martial arts so much, but the type of weapon doesn't really matter. I wanted to work on my swordsmanship some, though. She hummed and made a gesture like she was shaking something off her sword. I went flying again, barely managing to get my feet beneath me and bounce off the tree. Not that I don't enjoy this, because I do, I said honestly but you're not trying to show me that there are bigger fish or something, are you? Because, boy, do I know. Half my plan was trying to avoid getting into fights against people I could lose against. I can use observe, too, and see people's levels and stats and such. So, well, I know where I stand with most of the people around me. Even if I can't see their levels and stuff, that just means they're out of my league. It's pretty hard to me to underestimate people, honestly. I mean, I'll fight them anyway if I have to, but... Good, she said, coming to my side with that same casual serenity. She presumably passed through all the points between point A and B to get there, but I couldn't confirm that. I just reacted to my danger sense and brought up my shield in defense. Parrying even an absent attack sent shocks of pain through my arm and hammered me down hard enough that I felt dirt brush my ankles. Knowing where, Knowing you, stand, where you stand is vital to any battle. Knowing when you have to fight and when you can avoid it perhaps even more so. Your ability, makes, your ability makes such things easier for you than most, and that's good. If you had fought the wrong person. I heard worry color her voice a moment before the pressure on me lightened. I didn't relax, still aware of the danger, but instead brought up my shield. She flicked her blade several meters away and threw me back. You did well, John, she said, voice steady once more. I know something of the opponents you had to fight, the odds you had to face, and you did very well. 
and I won't insult you by saying you got lucky. Nah, luck had a fair amount to do with it. I shook my head. If I'd fought Penny anywhere but a dust mining town... Because I can see how far you've come. She continued, as if I hadn't said anything. But it's precisely because you've come this far that this is necessary. You've decided, haven't you? I knew what she was asking, and the answer was obvious. But I saw the gravity of her expression and knew how serious this question was, so I considered it silently for a moment. There were a lot of arguments to be made either way, but even so, the answer was still... Yes. Hold on, sorry. No, no problem. But ding Yes, yeah, sorry about that. Yes, I said at last. I want to help people. Hunter, healer, uh, it doesn't matter. But this is who I want to be. It's all I ever wanted. She nodded, looking at once saddened and proud. Then, if your mind's made up, I will train you. She replied. You don't need anyone to tell you that stronger opponents exist. You know that better than most your age. Your heart is in the right place. And though we dis will discuss your actions later, I trust it, and I trust you. Though you've made some choices I consider foolish, you made them for a reason I can see, and understand you took my words to heart when it came to the value of wisdom. Granted, if I had known how deeply such words would shape you, well, it doesn't matter, does it? You turned out well, John. However. She turned her face away, looking up at the sky. I don't know what she saw there, but it probably wasn't just the stars. You probably know this too, she said quietly. But we live in an unforgiving world. It's cruel to the innocent and the weak, and crueler still to those who'd fight to defend them. If you make a mistake out there, I can't promise you'll ever get a chance to make another one. And the awful truth is that we all make mistakes. I... Her lips tried to form words, but couldn't seem to give them breath. After a moment, she closed her mouth, apparently changing her mind. I'm glad that I got to see you grow up, she said. All of you. I had friends who never got to do so for their children and others who died too young to even consider having them. A lot of hunters simply disappear one day, go out on a mission that no one knew was special, and just never come back. Sometimes they leave behind bodies. Sometimes. Sometimes we don't even know until a week becomes a month. Your father and I had avoided that thus far, as far as have your sisters, but someday. Yeah. I said quietly, looking around at the ground, remembering a child's fears, a sister's words, lies we all hoped were true. I... I know. I've seen a lot of good men and women go. She continued after a moment. Some of them, maybe stronger than me. That I'm here and they aren't was only because of luck, skill, maybe a mixture. I don't know. But I do know that strength alone isn't always enough. Nor skill, nor even luck. The odds are against us. Because we can win a thousand times, but we only have to lose once, and it doesn't... She cut herself off for a moment, closing her eyes before continuing. Maybe that's why. She said, shaking her head. I didn't... I didn't want this. I'm sorry, I, I told myself I wouldn't stop you, and I won't. But I didn't want this life for any of you. But your sisters, one by one, they excelled. What I've seen others struggle with for years came to them so easily, and they were each so different from, but from the moment they could answer, it was like... She shook her head. They all wanted to be huntresses. They never wanted to be anything else, and everyone knew they would be great. One day, I knew they'd all surpass me. And some days I thought, God, some days I wondered if it was a punishment for, 
for living where others died, to send my children away to fight one by one. I never thought about it, even when I left home to do the same, but and then you were born, and I saw how much it hurt you every time you struggled, and it was horrible of me. But at the same time, I thought that maybe, maybe if you... I'm sorry, I whispered. No. She said, shaking her head. Don't be. I'm proud of you, and I'm proud of them, but I'm also scared for all of you. And when you didn't come back, I thought maybe this was it. The first. But you came back. I did, I agreed awkwardly. And we'll... They're all strong, so we'll... Yes. She agreed. They were all so strong. Maybe it was inevitable that this would happen, too. I always expected it. Really, that one day you'd find your way, and I wouldn't stand in it. We, but even if you're strong, strength always is... But even if you're strong, strength isn't always enough to let you win. So I trained all of your sisters when they decided they really wanted this. As best I could, I made sure they'd be safe. Is that why... I hesitated, unable to finish the question. Why they hate me? She asked calmly. Uh, they don't hate you, I protested immediately, even though I had raised the topic. They just don't like coming home. I trailed off lamely. They probably don't hate me. Not she really. Shook, she shook her head. Though, <laughs> if they did, I wouldn't blame them. I certainly hated my teacher, even if I owed her my life. I trained them hard. Even when things came so easily to them, I didn't let up. I told them what I do. I told them what I told you about the risks they'd face as hunters. And then I did my utmost to prepare them for it. I want to protect you all, but the truth is, I can't. So I'll make sure. You can protect yourselves, even if you hate me for it. For you especially, I know what you can withstand, and I wouldn't go easy on you. Not when the things I teach you might save your life. Knowing that, is this still what you want? Of course, I said instantly. I'm not afraid. This body of mine will keep going no matter how badly I get hurt. And I don't sleep, and I barely get tired. I heal quickly, no matter what happens, and I learn fast. Whatever it is, I'm ready. But I want you to know, I won't hate you. She looked me up and down, sighing slightly. We'll see. She said gently. And, and see. And see. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Very nice. Good reading. You did right? well, sir. You did well, sir. Likewise, madame. Likewise. Very cool. So we got uh, several new joiners. We got uh, Ian Mitchell. Uh, we got uh, Truffle Deronzo. Is your is that your real name? Truffle? If so, <laughs> amazing. Uh, Sindavaz, we already said hello to. And we got a few more people watching. So, uh, hey, if you are watching and uh, you're just keeping quiet, that's cool. But also, if you want to say hello, let us know you're here. Uh, just... Uh, type a comment in the chat and uh, we'll say hello. Um, worth uh, noting Ian up here. I know Ian Mitchell. I see you. Uh, <laughs> uh, he actually said wild waste better hide the kids for the record guys. In case anyone's wondering, we're, we're doing a clean scene from wild waste too. <laughs> so yes, <laughs> this is not for cringe theater. This is a clean scene. It's a dip <laughs> diplomatic scene. Yes. Wild, wild waste too. Is that what we're doing next? Uh, is that the one next on the docket? Uh, I do believe that's the next one on the docket. We should probably do that one then. What is a docket? I don't know. A list of things. Is that a list of things? Is it a small doc? Like a Maybe. tiny doc? A little, a little docket. It's a little docket. Is that where you? Is that where like tiny boats go? I little don't know. toy boats. Little toy boats. <laughs> toy boats. That's where and, you dock uh, toy boats. Is a docket. Yeah, and uh, rubber duckies. <laughs> yes, you're the one. 
Okay. <laughs> this is getting off topic. <laughs> maybe, maybe slightly. <laughs> All right, so I'm just gonna hit zoom and uh, so wild wastes. You are, uh, what's the story behind this one, Andrea? This is Wild Waste 2, baby, by Randy Darren. Woo! He's doing amazing right now. First one did awesome, I loved it, and it was so much fun to narrate. Yeah, if you've never listened to a guy have sex with a bug, so you can do that. That's totally an option now. I have never have sex with an ant soldier. I have never uh, seen that. Wow. Yeah, yeah, it is awesome. I love that book. <laughs> and Wild Way Stew is phenomenal. Like it, I can't even believe how well Randy Darren did on this book. It's just, I loved it. I read it on my um, on my vacation when I was gone. Yeah. And I literally read it straight through. It is like a twelve hour book. I just read it straight through because I Amazing. couldn't put it down. So. Oh. I was excited. Um, in this one, how we have it set up is basically uh, Vince is on his way to. This is under the assumption you guys know a little bit about the last one, so I will. I'll try not to spoil anything from the last one. But Vince is basically on his way to meet with some elves, and that's basically where we're picking up is him picking up the scouting report and then going to meet with them. And I am playing everyone. Uh, but Vince and the narrator. Yeah, you're um, you're basically playing all of the little rat folky guys and set, and uh, I, th I think Riss might be in here too. But basically, yeah, he is. Um, you're going, you're gonna play everybody except Vince and in my voice, the narrator. Okay, perfect. Let's take it away. That would be you, Dead Master. I found you. Hmm? <laughs> Den Master, I found you is you. Oh, oh, wait. Oh, oh. So th we're starting chapter three. Yeah, toward the middle. Oh, toward Den the middle. Oh, okay. We Den talked Master. about this, man. We talked about this. Yeah, but I, I wasn't <laughs> listening. I'm sorry. I was distracted. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Oh, no. Okay. So, okay. So if I go to the top of chapter three, there's Keep one scrolling. page. Den master, I found you squeaked a rat folk sliding up oh, to his oh, side. I got an idea. Den yes. master. Control F. The win. So anyway, oh, about Wild Waste 2, it's an awesome book, and yeah, you should go get it on ebook right now, and then you should buy it again when it comes out on audiobook, because I read it, and you know you want to hear that. Fuck yeah. So. <laughs> All right, here we go. Den Master, I found you! Squeaked a rat folk, sliding up to his side. Blades of grass fluttered in the air behind the diminutive scout. Rat folk looked pretty much like rats, though they walked, stood, and generally moved as a bipedal humanoid would. They were barely above two feet tall and could see in the dark. Great forward scouts. Greetings, Set, Vince said, smiling down at the rat folk. I assume you have news to report? Den Master, news, yes. Elves come early. Gert tracking their trail backwards. Riss in the field watching. The rat folk bobbed his head rap rapidly. I'm here to tell Den Master. You've done well. Now, how many elves were there? One hand to deliberate. One hand to be deliberate and gentle. Oh, I read that wrong. I'm sorry. It's had. One had to be deliberate and gentle with rat folk for the best answers. Oh, one paw. Five. And four claws. Four extra. So nine. Set held up his paws, displaying the numbers on his fingers. The four extra. Did they look like scouts? Yes, the master. Gert said they were scouts. They left quick, quick. Began searching. Vince held his hand up to his chin, his fingers stroking his jaw as he thought. Go back to Riss and await orders. If you're engaged, retreat and get back to Yosemite. Yes, yes, Den Master. Set turned and scurried off, his furry body vanishing in the long-bladed grass. Eva shifted her weight around, watching him. Thera had come over, her book and pencil held in one hand while she waited for orders. Eva, could you track down Karaya and get her over here? I think our time's been spent. The wood elf popped up to a standing position and then flitted off. Thera moved over to her pack and slipped the pencil and book inside. Lord, 
Do we prepare for combat? Asked the Dark Elf as she began to close the flaps again. Unfortunately, I... Unfortunately, I'd love to believe they're peaceful, but only a fool gives trust to someone he has no reason to. Thera agreed with a nod of her head. Reaching back behind her head, she gathered her raven-dark hair and tied it up with a loop of leather cord. Lifting her sword free from the sheath, she let it go, checking the pull on it. Vince watched the warrior elf as she made her preparations. Vince then internalized his thoughts. He had to prepare what he, pro he wanted to say to the ambassadors. Suddenly, he found himself wishing he was still just a ranger, running from coast to coast with the mail. Being a postman was a lot easier. The High Elves didn't seem surprised to see Vince when he showed up in front of them. They were more than aware I'd left already. That and the fact that they'd set up a portable pavilion made a cloth as if they were already expecting him. Not a word had been spoken yet, and he wasn't sure really how to begin. Vince smiled casually across the table at the three High Elves arranged in front of him. They were all older, having the look of men in their sixties. And from what he knew of elven lifespans, that meant they were pretty freaking old. They stared back at him, their hands folded in front of him. At least he brought some entertainment for later, muttered one of them. It was so soft Vince would have missed it if it wasn't for his extraordinary hearing. The eyes of the one who spoke moved up to Thera, Eva, and Kariah behind him. Seriously? They think I brought bed toys? Ugh, I don't have time for this tired-ass bullshit. No, they're not here for entertainment. They're my companions and loved ones, Vince said darkly. Now, I've come on behalf of Yosemite City, by your request. How would you like to begin this conference? Vince asked simply. simply. The elf on the left's face puckered in a sour grimace. The middle one sat up straight, and the one on the right clenched his hands together. We would never request to meet with a human, the one on the left said through gritted teeth. Great, then I'll be leaving. I have things to do, and if this was a waste of time, so be it. Vince stood up and pushed his chair in. Wait, said the elf in the corner. His voice was soft, but firm. My name is Cairn. My apologies. Please forgive these three. Cairn was younger than the other three, had been dressed in simpler attire, and had hung in the back so far. Vince didn't stop and picked up his messenger bag and picked up the folder Alicia had prepared for him. Please, we did request your presence, and we've come in good faith. I apologize for them again. Vince stopped, looking at the young elf with a flat stare. Sit, please. This was an error. The pot-licking of old elves who don't understand the world. Cairn stood between the two of the older elves now, his hands gesturing to the chair Vince had left. Click. Clicking his tongue, Vince considered leaving. He didn't have any desire to be here, and this was really... He didn't have any desire to be here, and this really was a reasonable excuse that would have him out of here in a hurry. You three, leave. Now. Karen said, gesturing to the three sitting at the table. No, sir, I'd leave, or I'll kill you, and hand your heads over to the king of Yosemite as a gift hissed Cairn. At that point, the other three got up and angrily left, their eyes promising death and pain to the young elf. Vince wasn't completely convinced this wasn't all for his benefit. He'd seen similar negotiation tactics in the past, where one person would took on the role of the villain and the other the hero. One would be more inclined to work with the hero, with a positive attitude and trust. Narrowing his eyes, Vince pulled out his chair and sat back down. He was determined to let his opponent show their hand first. Behind him, he heard the creak of Eva's leather armor and Thera's chainmail hauberk rustling. They were preparing themselves to launch an attack at any second. Your compatriots seem high-strung, Karen said, taking the vacated center seat. Be thankful I didn't bring my troll. She takes offense to those who are rude to me. We almost fed your messengers to her on our first meeting when they attacked me. And, to be honest, so far, 
I'm not impressed and see no reason to deal or treat with you and your kind. Oh, that's me. <laughs> oh, that's you. I don't know why <laughs> it's a new... <laughs> well, <laughs> pardon me. <laughs> we almost fed your messengers to her on our first meeting when they attacked me. And to be honest, so far, I'm not impressed. And I see no reason to deal or treat with you and your kind. You've been as bad as, well, humans. Vince smirked at Karen. He hoped the man was insulted. Karen's eyes scrunched for a mi microsecond, his mouth flattening to a line, his nostrils flaring. Mastering himself, the elf held up a hand. It is as you say, I'm afraid. We've been terrible neighbors. I'd like to fix that. First, I'd like to invite you to Varix, the city itself, as a guest of honor. Second, I believe we can begin with a simple non-aggression pact between Varix and Yosemite. This would only be until we can negotiate a trade agreement. Vince controlled himself as best he could. Going to their city wasn't in his plans, but the other half of his statement was welcome news. Though, I must confess, we're under a bit of a crisis. Ah, uh, here it is. Always a catch. But this is neither the time or place to discuss that. Would you be willing to accept a non-aggression treaty and the invitation? No. Vince said bluntly. I've no reason to trust you or put myself in your city as your guest and at your mercy. I see. Ah, uh, would you be willing to do so under a life oath from myself and the others here? Nope. That's great for your own word, but it holds no, under no one underneath you responsible. Pass. I'm saddened for this conference to end here, but unless you can offer me some type of ironclad guarantee on my safety, I wouldn't be willing to walk into the proverbial lion's den. Vince shrugged his shoulders. He wasn't stupid or foolish. He trusted no one until they earned it. Karen's face was a mask of neutrality at the moment. He was doing a much better job of masking his emotions right now than earlier. Through his fingers, though his fingers were pressed tight to the table between them. If it helps bridge the gap. That's me. I'd be Oh, that's you. Okay. If it helps bridge the gap, I'd be willing to travel to the outskirts of the city, but I don't plan on entering it under any reason. It doesn't do to turn oneself into a ready-made hostage, Vince said. And if our entire ruling council offered guest rights on top of that life oath? Alicia had told them they'd got to that point of, they'd get to that point eventually. At that point, they'd be putting themselves on a magical devil. <laughs> At that point, they'd be putting themselves on a magical debt level. That would I... I'm killing it right now. I'm killing it. I'm killing it. <laughs> I talk it. for I, a living. Can I, you tell? I, I'm trying to find where you are, actually. You know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. I'm going to start this sentence over again because I saw Jeff type something and it yeah, really distracted me. It distracted Jeff me, has. too. <laughs> No, I'm not a Southerner, Jeff. It's Vince. <laughs> I'm from California. Okay, anyway. <clears throat> yes, magical debt level devil face. Okay. Alicia had told him they'd get to that point eventually. At that point, they'd be putting themselves on a magical debt level that would annihilate the entire city's population if they broke it. It wasn't something they'd offer unless he put them on unless they put him in an untenable situation where he refused every possibility up to that point. I'd accept at that point, though I'd want the guest rights and oath before entering the city. My retainers, Vince said, and motioned over his shoulder to the three ladies behind him, can act as contractors for the magical side. They've all been rough, they've all been thoroughly schooled in that matter. Karen peered at Vince intently before giving him a wide predator's grin. You were waiting for guest rights. Saying nothing, Vince stood back up and collected his possessions. We'll be traveling to Varix, and we'll announce ourselves when we arrive. I would hope the oath and rights can be established within a few hours of that point. Good day. Turning on his heel, Vince left and set off to the northwest. 
in the opposite direction of where his scouts were hiding. Asshats. And see. Hey. <laughs> we got to get a laugh track, go or not a laugh track, a um, <laughs> applause, audience applause on this. Google right. Hangouts used to have something like that, but they don't anymore. So sad. Broken hearted. Yeah. That was great. That was great, Andrea. You did fabulously for having Likewise. to pop in randomly. <laughs> that was awesome. No, oh, that, was, uh, that was fun. Uh, so I was wondering, though, those rat folk, I yes. did like the rat folk and like the tone of it is not conducive to that voice at all. <laughs> you know, like the tone of it should be like, uh, I don't know, like what what was the description of them? On here or did, that I told you? On here. Oh, yeah, here. they're, yeah, they're up moved there. Hold as on. bipedal humanoids would. They were barely above two feet tall. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. If they're, yeah, barely above two feet yeah. tall. They have, they have tiny voices, but they're little. Yeah, they're little guys. Little guys. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. That was great. I, uh, very, very nice to read. That was cool. Wild Wastes 2, everybody. Wild Wastes 2, available now in ebook format. And available in a few weeks in audio format. Yeehaw! It is spoken, <laughs> told to you in a southern accent. Yeah. Vince is just a ranger. He's got a fucking problem talking in a clear voice, right? <laughs> That's just how he likes talking. Well, well, didn't you do a Georgia accent on a previous audio book? Do you yes. think maybe that's well, uh... I forgot the Georgia Graham, <laughs> where the entire book was read exactly like this. The whole damn narration, all the of it whole like this. Damn thing. It was a lot of fun, actually. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. I just got really, really fatigued talking like that the whole time. <laughs> well, I'm sure you had to fan yourself. Yes. I was getting the vapors. <laughs> I'm trying to get yours pulled up. Oh yeah, what are we doing next? What's that? Uh, what's Re on our docket? Reboot. Yeah, it is. Reboot. Uh, yeah. So um, this is a uh, this is the the book that I narrated that was just released a few weeks ago on Audible.com, written by the ever talented Domino Finn. And um, the chapter you are going to be hearing. Uh, well, actually, you know what, I'll, I guess I'll tell you a little bit about the premise of this book. Uh, Tad Lonerman is the main character. And the way the lit RPG plays into this book is that uh, he dies. He, he, he dies in a car accident. No spoilers, don't worry, it happens in the first <laughs> chapter, so it's okay. Uh, and he's uploaded into a, a video game. His, his soul is basically uploaded into a video game. Uh, because of insurance that he has. He works for a game company that is working on this special project. And um, uh, really, really neat concept. He's, he's uploaded into it, and then he's going around, and there's some... Uh, he's going around in the world of Haven, I should say. And he gets to play an RPG instead of living in the real world, which kind of sounds all right to me. Um and at this point in the book, he has uh, done a little bit of leveling. He has met his roommate, who is also going to be in the scene. And uh, the two of them have decided to go off into the wilderness and grind. Uh, his roommate, Kyle, is kind of a, um, a frat boy, you know, underachiever sort of guy. So he was kind of reluctant to go out grinding. But uh, here they are. And uh, we'll see what the two of them run into. And as for who we're reading, I'm going to be playing um, Talon. Talon is Tad's video game name. And uh, he's also the narrator. And other than that, uh, all the other voices are going to be provided to you by the wonderful, talented uh, Miss Andrea Parsano. Yes. C'est toi. <laughs> all right uh so he's, he, from, he's canadian from the actual place that that name comes from so he actually says it appropriately more appropriately than even than i do but kind of awesome <laughs> you have to do it uh with the uh wee oui, wee oui after pass no wee oui, oui. like i learned pomade was said pomade the other day like that pomade pomade <laughs> i was like well i've been saying that wrong and i'll probably continue to say it unless i gotta say it in a book because 
pomade is not what my brain thinks. Uh, if you want to say it like a jerk, you say pomade. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's pomade. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Chapter 17, Goblin Commander. The imps hopped and chittered in noisy unison, mere animals, unable to hide their growing anticipation for blood. The two goblins were more restrained. They stood upright, wore torso coverings of thick hide, and held long daggers. The little stickers were twisted and jagged and probably loaded with five kinds of hep. We're so screwed, bro. I smiled. The party chat wouldn't be visible to pagans. It was a great way to strategize in secret, provided we had the concentration to apply it. Uh, don't worry. L let's keep our heads and stay defensive. You still have that grenade, right? Ready and waiting. And it's a oh, goblin. Oh, that's me. Okay, that's a <laughs> goblin guy. Trixie spies! Accused the goblin captain, waving his blade at us. I knew that merchant wasn't alone! I shivered. Somehow the fact the creature could talk made him more vile. The imps howled at the reference to the beheaded man on the road. They wanted more of the same. We didn't know him, I contested. We were just wandering the Midlands. These lands are free, spat the goblin subordinate. An imp swiped at me with a claw. I maneuvered my spear between us to back it off. The imp tags were yellow now, indicating a simple challenge. In the tutorial, when I'd been level one, they were orange. That was the good news. Six imps would be a challenge, but with clever tactics, Kyle and I could take them. The goblin and goblin captain, however, spoiled our chances. One name orange, one name red. That was Haven's way of saying the goblin would be tough, and it would be outright stupid to attack the captain. Maybe we should have run when we'd had the chance. Lies! screeched their leader, face twisting in anger. Humans is in their lies. You were hunting the errant folk. You were. I can smell the stink of your actions from here. I scowled. My pagan notoriety was working against me already. I, I only defended myself, I countered. I I'll do the same right now if I need to. The captain snickered. It was an uneven choking sound that set me on edge. He looked to the other goblin. The tricksy human wants to best us in combat. Uh, no, I cut in, inspired by our experience with the pack rats. I want to offer a gift, a, a passing token to the pagans who rule these wild lands. A passing token, and then we can be on our way. The imps chittered wildly. The goblins narrowed their eyes. They were suspicious of all humans, but they weren't immune to flattery. Whether ego or curiosity, their eyes twinkled. Gift? Said the goblin subordinate, testing the word. What gift? Hand them the grenade. What? You're crazy. Remember the mother rat? Hand them the grenade. Oh, should I crack it first? No, no, no. Let me handle that part. Kyle produced his final corrosive grenade. It really was beautiful, in a way. Custom-blown glass, thin and sturdy, with a reflective black gel inside that settled unevenly. Kyle held the offering out, and the goblin soldier snatched it and backed away. What's this? He asked, studying it closely. A crystal ball, I answered. It tells the fortune of those who peer into its depths. The captain arched an eyebrow and peeked over his man's shoulder. Seriously, I continued. Throughout history, civilizations have risen and fallen due to the influence of the Black Orb. Okay, bro. <laughs> you might be laying it on a bit thick. Let me see that, snapped the leader. He snatched the grenade from his comrade's hand and placed it before his eyes. How does it turn on? Chances were, this encounter was going to result in combat no matter what I did. 
My pagan rep was all but guaranteed that. If these creatures wanted blood so badly, the best thing was to give it to them before they were ready. Attacking the captain was suicidal, but I'd never get a better shot. I leveled the spear at the distracted leader and triggered Deadshot. In a split second, the iron pierced my target. Not the captain, but the corrosive grenade he held. The glass orb shattered and the spear dug into the goblin's eye. The resultant explosion was vicious. I rolled away, hoping the length of my spear was enough to keep me out of range. Between my improved stats, the technique, and the added corrosive gel, the damage didn't disappoint. Surprise! Critical hit! You dealt 82 damage to Goblin Captain. The pagan was thrown backward and landed in the dirt. He snarled and rolled to his side, face blackened with slime. His shriek, he shrieked in pain and anger. Trixie! Kill them! My jaw dropped. That had been my strongest hit yet. The captain had shrugged it off. Note to self, no more attacking reds. Watch out! shouted Kyle. He swung his sword as the other goblin charged me. Because the creature's attention was divided, Kyle scored a decent hit. I readied my spear, but couldn't trigger Deadshot during the cooldown. Twenty seconds didn't sound like much, but it was an, an, an eternity in combat. Instead, his blade met my spear in a cross block. He spun away and came at me again. I stabbed forward. The goblin had decent defensive technique, batting my iron to the side. But he was a shrimp compared to me. His three-foot frame and puny weapon couldn't counter the full weight of my thrust. Despite being knocked off mark, my point found the goblin's side. He growled and swung at me, but he was way out of range. I was liking my choice of spear more and more every minute. Kyle took advantage of the distraction to score another hit on the goblin. Despite being a superior level, we already had him down to half health just like that. I was starting to think orange enemies weren't too bad after all. Then the rest of the pagans caught up with us. The imps converged, three on Kyle and three on me. They threw themselves at us with reckless abandon. And I would have been reckless had our weapons been pointed at them. Instead, while we were busy with the advanced mobs, the low-level ones swarmed us with ease. We took immediate and serious hits. I knocked the pagans away with the flat of my weapon. I considered sweeping again to clear the path, but Kyle had stumbled to his knees. An imp took the opportunity to jump on the back of his neck and bite. I triggered a dash to escape my imps and assist Kyle. I struck before my zippy movement was finished, before the beastie could strike a killing blow. I impaled it on my spear, not a crit, but a solid attack that drained most of the imp's health and stunned it. The opening easily allowed a second strike to finish it off. The other imps reared at my approach. They congregated onto the battlefield. For all our effort, only one pagan was dead. That left five howling critters, a goblin subordinate, and a wounded captain just now regaining his feet. We were screwed. Take the imps, barked Kyle. He charged straight at the weakened goblin. My next spear thrust found more flesh, but the imp had avoided lethal damage. I found myself unable to fully commit to any blow lest the rest of the pack spill in. No, I said, we need to run. We need to get out of here. I can do this, said Kyle. His sword came down in a hard overhead strike. The goblin easily set to parry, but Kyle's strength was impressive. He must have dropped another point in the attributes since he leveled. The little goblin couldn't cancel the sword's momentum. His dagger twisted down as Kyle's hammering blow landed on his head. Imp teeth dug into my neck. I spun away in panic. It wasn't pain I felt exactly, but absolute horror filled in, in the blanks for my brain. Like when that boggart had slip, slurped on my intestines. The mind wasn't meant to experience that. I swung my weapon overhead in hasty arcs. I spun in circles, watching all approach angles, doing anything I could to keep the pagans off me. Kyle incurred a grievous injury. The goblin sticker sunk into his stomach all the way to the hilt. My roommate battered his enemy weakly, scoring decent hits but clearly losing now. I growled and tumbled as claws scraped my back. This was it then, the moment of our deaths. I felt my intestines spill from my belly, the paralyzing terror of that Pepsi trailer sliding right at me. 
This was helplessness all over again. Virtual blood boiled within me. I couldn't accept that. Not that easy. If I was going to bite it, I'd be damned if I didn't take one of these sickos with me. My dash was still unusable, so I had to do it the old-fashioned way. I charged Kyle and the goblin and lined up my weapon. An imp blocked my path, so I speared him and kept barreling ahead. The iron popped through the imp and stuck the goblin's gut as I crashed into them with full force of my body. The tackle ripped the goblin off Kyle. It rocketed us over the smooth, sloping edge of the hill. Head over heels, the goblin, the imp, and I turned down the hillside. I held onto my spear for dear life. And scene. Hey. <laughs> I don't know why I keep doing that. That wasn't agreed on. I just keep doing it. <laughs> that, uh, that ended up having a lot more narration in it at the end than I was expecting. It started again, but I was like, oh, crap. There actually, there's another page. Do you, you want know to what? do this last bit? No, no, no. Let's let's leave it there because uh, there might be some spoilers on the next page. So this, oh, okay. this might work. Better. I'm sorry. There was a table, so it broke it. So it looked like this was the end. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Sorry, that's okay. That's bad. okay. I I did the exact same thing when I was recording, and I'd get to like, oh, like, oh, yes, the end of the chapter, because there would be like nothing on like a page, and yeah. then I turn the page just to check, and it's just like a huge table. <laughs> it's a table. Yeah. Uh, my bad. All right, perfect. there we go. That was cool. That's a great book. <laughs> it is. It is really what Domino did a fantastic job on it. I had a blast narrating it, and some of the character voices just were a blast to do there was one voice actually the hardest voice for that one do you do you want to know what it was for me what? uh general american oh really that's what I, it was my first audiobook so i didn't know that i had a canadian accent oh i guess you do you do have a slight have, canadian accent i do i have a slight canadian accent and it's there were some key words that domino was like dude i love the reading style we got to do something about these words and about <laughs> a, about <laughs> about is one of them yeah about out house yeah so i i went through and i highlighted all of the owl sounds the outs and yep. abouts and the vowel other one, ipa it's vowel IPA. substitutions ipa That's exactly what it is yeah and uh, the other one was um oh uh uh sorry pardon me <laughs> sorry that one just killed him <laughs> it was like oh okay, wow you lay into that r hard i didn't know that sorry wow so, yeah so now it's sorry yeah it's, we say it's sorry sorry instead of sorry uh, <laughs> which sorry. Is, it's funny like it's so easy to get into that well which, that doesn't make sense because it's not worry but yeah no then again language just doesn't make sense phonics in no. general are just uh ridiculous no, take a couple dialects classes and you'll find that that's it. If you've been, yeah. if you have dialect training at all, and, they, and I'm sure you do, it's like anybody out there. So if you take dialect training, you realize it's all just made up. It's all made up. Every None bit of, of it. it makes sense. None, None of it makes of it sense. <laughs> it's just anytime, like, oh, it's anytime you see on a video of like how to do a Scottish accent, there will be half of the people commenting on that video will say, I'm Scottish and I don't talk this way. Why they're a surfer right now, I don't know. But like, yeah. I'm Scottish and I don't talk this way. And it's like, yeah, there's like 14 different Scottish accents minimum. Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then hybrids of all of those because it just happens. Anyway, uh, dialects. It's so fascinating though, dialects and um, phonics. And mm -hmm. it is so cool just how you can just change something slightly, just a vowel slightly and make it sound a little little you know it's it's just the vowels that i'm changing here but it's it's totally different yep it's completely it. different that's that right. when you're doing when you're learning how to do it all you you learn the key sounds and key phrases that have to be yeah. switched like if you're doing um uh scottish or cockney you have to learn the glottal stops the, the yeah the gotten, gotten versus gotten Ooh. Yeah, little. I heard you doing it. I was listening to some of your uh, samples on Audible, and you you sound fantastic on your Aww, recordings. Thank by the you. way, absolutely amazing. Great <laughs> sound production, you. just like a smooth, velvety uh, sound. So oh really well done. But giving me the vapors. You giving me the, the vapors. Vapors. Uh, but uh, the one book I can't. I think it might have been Dominion. You did a Scottish accent. Uh, Is it Dominion. 
Falling Out of Focus was the big one because that Falling was actually like a modern. But yeah, Dominion, it's in the sample because that's gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Little. Yeah, and I was dwarf. like, so did it's, you take a. It's what was it? heavy. That's like a dwarvish Scottish accent. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like that, that's a heavy. That's not even true Scottish. That's and not also, true Scottish. my husband just said it South African's a nightmare. Uh, oh, <laughs> there's yeah. a South African magic hippo in that book that. I walked around the house going South African, South African, South African, South, 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 eh, uh. I, I walked around the house making stupid noises well, for days. I find that those accents are tricky. South African and uh, Australian. I like, yeah. I haven't, I haven't really sat down and looked at what they are, but whenever I just try to do it when I'm drunk, I uh, <laughs> always like, it always turns either British because the, you know, history. Or yeah. it turns into like Jamaican. I don't know why. It just ends up like Jamaican. Yeah. And then Jamaican turns into Italian for some reason. And it just kind of flip flops <laughs> into these different. Yeah. So basically, Australian is supposed to be Cockney if you chew on it a little bit. Yeah. And I can't, don't ask me to do I cannot do a, I have not tried an Australian accent. It's not in my repertoire. We're just going to nope. Nope. <laughs> just gonna put a solid uh, nope stamp on that. And yes, a hundred percent it is, Jeff. That was I walked around the house doing that the eh 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 sooth eh for eh eh because your jaw has to go back. Anyway, anybody who doesn't like accents is so bored with this conversation right now. We need to move on. Okay. Sorry guys. We nerded out for a minute. All right. Moving on. Which one are we doing next? We are going to move on to uh, Only Sense Online. Oh, man. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. For, uh, in my defense, this is sight reading, and I'm not sure <laughs> how well I'm going to do with this, but I'm going to try. I've never, I've never, I, I don't know what to do with this one. I don't know what to expect with this one. Yeah. It's, uh, w what's the history behind this one again? Okay. This one is the one that has the unique characters, and there's actually a switch in it. Um, it's a little bit strange because Mew is a 14 year old girl and she has like, Mew is going to talk like this. Like everything she says is really high pitched and energetic. Like that's just how she talks. Okay. But Shun is you or Shun or Yoon and high pitched voice for a boy, almost a girl's voice. Now here's the problem. Okay. It's only when he's actually thinking apparently in the game, Shun Yoon becomes a girl in the game because it downloads wrong. Like it or it uploads wrong. So it's mistaken. Oh, nice. So this is gonna be so hard, guys, <laughs> but we're gonna try really, really hard. Okay. And um Takumi is like the typical smug macho high school jock. That's you. Okay. All right, cool. And right. Shizuka is college girl. She's gonna be like just doesn't get overexcited, lower pitch female voice. Um and Magi, I think it's Magi or Maggie, age okay. unknown, guessing 20, voice similar to normal female, speaks very confidently. So I'm both of those, I guess. You're both of the You're, last two. Yeah. Are you sure you don't want to take the narration on this? Because I have more characters. <laughs> I can I can try the narration, yeah. You want to do it? Just because totally I have more don't. characters in it, so I'm freaked out. So Okay. Right he gets to do it now because I don't want to do it. All right, all right. I, I've been I will... complaining about this one. I don't know. I'm scared of it. <laughs> I'll, I'll try this narration. I'm excited. Uh, okay, this is Only Sense Online, written by. It'll be in the chat. Um, Brrr, somebody, somebody say who wrote this. It's critic is the one who translated it, but I'm not sure. Shen is the uh, Shen is the jock dude, right? Yeah. Jock. And then the oh, other Aloha Zakao. Aloha Zako. Aloha Zako. Z A C H O U. I'm assuming that's Zakao or Zako. Zakao. Zakao. We'll go with that. That seems right. Yeah. He's informed on the subject. I believe you. Oh, 100% informed. I was talking to him last night. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Here we go. Only Sense Online, Volume 1. Chapter 1. Official opening and a mishappen, misshapen, mis, mishappen senses. It was 8 o'clock in the morning. Mew fidgeted as she was eating toast for breakfast. Wait a second. 
Who's this speaking? Hold on, because I'm in the PDF. So I'm trying to get the right. The right page? Uh, I think it's page 13. I'm prepared. Okay, I'm good. I'm good. We're, we're doing chapter one, right? right? Not the not the prologue? Yeah, we're doing chapter one. Okay, and who who's who's got this first line here? I have no... Uh, I'm not... I'm not sure. Sure, I think it's Mew. Oh, it's okay. Shun. It's Shun. Someone's... Thank you for helping Shun. us, guys, because it's not real... It's not, like, tagged. Everything isn't tagged. Okay. All right. So Shun is first. Hey, why... Okay. It was 8 o'clock in the morning. Mew fidgeted as she was eating toast for breakfast. Hey, why are you being so restless? It's going to start at 11 o'clock, right? Yep. That's why make an early lunch, please. And we have a gaming marathon afterwards. Rejected. We're going to have a proper meal at 12 o'clock. Also, we're not going to spend that much time playing. Hearing my serious... Oh, okay. Hearing my serious... Shen is not the jock. Shun is the boy with the the voice, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, yes. I'm going to agree with you. <laughs> okay, so Shun, Shun is yeah, the... Yeah, Shun is the one who has the boy voice, but it's high pitch, and then it becomes a girl. Okay, and then the other guy, the jock Takumi. guy, who's that? Takumi. Takumi is the jock, yeah. All right. Got it. Thank you. Sorry about the hiccups, guys. All cool. right. Let's do a pop filter. Shun MC. Uh, all right. Chapter one. <laughs> Official opening and misshapen senses. <laughs> It was eight o'clock in the morning. Mew fidgeted as she was eating toast for breakfast. Hey, why are you being so restless? It's going to start at 11 o'clock, right? Yep, that's why I make an early lunch, please. And we have a gaming marathon afterwards. Uh, rejected. We're going to have a proper meal at 12 o'clock. Also, we're not going to spend that much time playing. Hearing my serious declaration, my sister let out a... Boo. Boo. <laughs> in complaint. I thought of saying, you should at least help out with homework during summer holidays, but after considering that she only would get in my way, I remained silent. Good grief. All right. Then let's have simple fried rice. Yay! Thank you, Onichan! I muttered, jeez, what a kid. After that, I finished the housework and started wondering as I prepared lunch. For dinner tonight, I'll just make something hot with sumen. I considered the nutritional balance and something that can be prepared by boiling in water. It would be nice to have bambanji chicken for the fried food as well as pickled eggplant. If I make Mew's favorite shrimp and vegetable fritters, she will definitely come down from the second floor. In order to immerse in the bliss of eating something crispy, she would even put her gaming time on hold. I want Mew to eat it as soon as possible. I thought of spoiling my little sister like that. And at 11 o'clock, I put on the VR gear and laid down on the bed. When I started it up, the hypnotic induction began. The feeling I had was that of my, was that of my body falling asleep and my head becoming really clear. After that, my field of view spread out and I appeared in a pure white space. Choose a name. After I was prompted by a female mechanical voice, I typed in a name on the semi-transparent keyboard that appeared in front of me. As I wasn't accustomed to VR, I carefully typed in my own name, Siun, and confirmed it. The semi-transparent screen twitched, switched and a selection of tutorials appeared. Since I obtained information from the guide sites ahead of time, I didn't need it. If there is something I need, I'll just ask Shizuka Ni or Mew. I chose to skip it. And then a spectacle appeared before me. Around me there was a flood of people. A lot of people seemed to have logged in. And for me, who arrived in the VR world for the first time, it was a very strange experience. Well, I didn't feel any VR-specific discomfort, but for some reason my hair was longer, and my butt felt somehow more round. What's this about? An icon appeared in the edge of my field of vision. I quickly looked towards it and selected the audio input. Chat open. 
Chat open. Ah. Wait, I think hold that's on. You. I'm trying to figure out who's who because I'm supposed to talk like you talk in game. Oh, I see. Okay. I think that's Mew. Okay. Okay. So you're you're chat you're chat open. Button. So that would probably be it. Let's see your cadence. Chat open. Ah, uh, Onichan, did you connect? What? It's Mew, huh? You surprised me. At the moment, I was unable to assess the current situation, and my thinking was being interrupted. However, I calmed down when I rec recognized the caller's voice as Mew's. Got it. I'm going there now. I moved from the... I think uh, that's your line. There's too many people. I don't know which one's here. <laughs> no, you... Okay, so she is has the weird brackets. Mew okay, has the weird brackets. Okay, and then, yeah. There's too many people here, so we can't find each other. Onichan and I arrived at the cathedral on the north. We'll wait for you there. Got it. I'm going there now. I moved from the spot immediately. I hated crowds. Moreover, many of them were staring at me. In front of the cathedral, there were many people meeting up with each other. I looked for Mew among them. Hey, Onichan, have you arrived yet? Yeah, I did, but where are you? Under the church's statue, white hair. Onichan has light blue hair. I finally found her. Certainly, her hair was white. Next to her, there was a person who wore a magician's robe and had light blue hair. It was a beautiful woman with slightly droopy eyes and a mole under one of them. The colors were different, but it was a person I was familiar with. I called out to them. You're Mew, right? Uh, yes, I'm Mew, but who are you? It's me, your brother, Shun. Um, Shun-chan? Oni-chan hasn't met you for a while, so she doesn't know you, but when did you change your gender? No. Onichan, that didn't happen. That's not the problem here. Why did Onichan turn into Onichan? I don't know how to say those differently enough to make that make sense. So we're just gonna let that sit because it's uh, it's Onichan versus Onichan. I don't know. I don't speak Japanese. <laughs> and uh, there is a break to show a picture of three girls. One of them looks to be shouting. I can even screen share it because. Why not? Here we go. Right thing to do. Oh wait, application window. There it is. There we go. So we're scrolling down. Do 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 do. All right, and then uh, I'll take screen share off. Stop. 